Okay, John. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Curtis, and I'm the uh, here in the capacity of Chair of the New Zealand Grasslands Trust. I want to welcome you to the Ray Brown Trophy winner presentation. Again this year, it's an online presentation. Now questions can be asked through the chat option and we will consider these at the end of the talk. Each year, the New Zealand Grass and Trust awards the Ray Brown Trophy to a person associated with the pastoral farming industries who has made an outstanding national contribution over their working career. This was instituted in memory of Dr. Ray Brown, Director of DSI Grasslands from 1970 to 1985. In 2020, the Ray Brown Trophy was awarded to Gerald Rice. Gerald has been the Principal Science Advisor at MPI since 2012. Most recently, he's been providing advice on policies for national science, particularly uh, to MB, including National Statement of Science Investment, New Contestable Funds, CRI Core Funding, Funding for Databases and Collections, National Science Challenges, particularly our land and water, Regional Research Initiatives, and he is a Proposal Evaluator for the Endeavour Fund for MB. Prior to being a Principal Science Advisor, he was a Senior Scientist, Natural Resources Group at MAP for 12 years. Before that, he worked for the Ministry of Research, Science and Technology, for those of us who remember MB, in a variety of roles for 10 years, having come from MAP Technology, where he was a scientist for 15 years. Gerald is the author or co-author of over 170 scientific, technical and conference publications, 11 major departmental reports, commissioned and direct supervision of over 250 significant external contracted science reports. He is considered to be the bastion of common sense science and agriculture by his colleagues at MPI, where his contribution has been recognised with the 2018 Director General Science Prize acknowledging an exceptional science career. Gerald has been awarded the Ray Brown Trophy for Anyway, Gerald has been awarded the Ray Brown Trophy for a con for his contribution to New Zealand pastoral agriculture through providing expert science and policy advice in resource areas of contaminants, climate change, water, forage, land use, nutrients, soils, precision agriculture, and extension and adoption. Gerald, we look forward to hearing what you have for us this afternoon. Over to you. Well, good afternoon, um, everybody. And once we've got through the technology um, limitations, um, thank you very much for listening to uh, my presentation this afternoon. I've called it a random walk um, through 45 years uh, in agricultural science and the science system. Firstly, I'd like to thank the, uh, Ray, the, the Grasslands um, Trust for awarding me the, this um, prestigious award. Ray Brown was renowned both nationally and internationally for his advocacy, for strong advocacy for, agri for grassland science. And I'm, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be associated with this particular award. Just starting off to all participants in this new way of running conferences and communicating, it's great to see guests and colleagues and friends from near and far. I'd like to take you through this random walk uh, of my career. The first topic to acknowledge, I think, is the change circumstances we find ourselves in, the impact that a disease can make on the world 
our country, the economy and science. That said, some of our farmers have been exposed to this recently as well through, for instance, the mycoplasma bovis outbreak and the hard decisions that had to be made about this its eradication. The COVID lockdown has provided opportunities for us all to look back and reflect on our past science so that we can move forward in a future COVID world. What's the first thing I did uh, after being rung by John and being offered this award? I went to the Grasslands Association website and looked at the names of the previous recipients. I can honestly say, much to my delight, that I knew all the recipients over the last 10 years, most of whom have been colleagues and friends and even the odd classmate from my days getting a big ag science at Massey. The second thing was to look at past Brougham lectures. They provide interesting reading in a potted history of developments and progress in ag and grassland science in New Zealand. What could I bring to this eminent past lectures? My career path has certainly been different to most scientists in New Zealand. Um, having been a district agricultural scientist, then moving into the policy world of core government. Just looking at what we've, um, we have in our circumstances at present, um, I want to talk about, is ruminant agriculture at a crossroads? Grassland scientists need to be more closely linked to ruminants, I believe, as these two um, species co-evolved together over 20 to 30 million years. The unique uh, ruminant symbiosis with its ruminant microflora factory, converting a highly indigestible lignin containing grassland species into human food needed uh, for the, the global population, is an essential part of our global ecosystems. However, we are currently seeing an anti-animal pro-plant thrust in food demand. I recall just yesterday reading an article where they claimed that 50% of, uh, no, 50% more emissions were produced by animal agriculture than through plant food uh, systems. We need to be resolute advocates for our grassland systems, which have unique positive features and will continue to hold New Zealand's economy in good stead. Uh, much of this comment about the um, pro-plant, anti-animal agriculture is based on the greenhouse gas emissions from both those systems. We know that animal agriculture produces about 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Thus, producers need to be cost effective um, in the ways that they seek to lower emissions while meeting consumer demands for high quality, safe and affordable food produced from healthy animals. Against this, um, greenhouse gas emissions per unit of milk and meat product in New Zealand have continuously declined over past decades, approximately 1% per annum, due to improvements in production, efficiency, animal performance underpinned by science and innovation in our grasslands. So what has my career path been? I started off um, on a dairy farm, being brought up on a dairy farm on the um, ash country underneath Mount Tarawera, south of Rotorua. From there, I went to Massey University and got a Bachelor of Ag Science degree. My career began uh, when the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries in those days, in 1975, um, being poached out of Massey by uh, Barry Keenan, who was then the uh, Human Resources um, Officer at MAF, to become what was called a District Agricultural Scientist in Taranaki, replacing Norm Thompson while he did his uh, Masters. I remember my first paper at Grasslands Conference was on Matua prairie grass, little heard of these days, but nevertheless a good perennial winter performer, and a species we should reconsider and further improve. I spent 15 years doing uh, field research in Taranaki, Manawatu, Hawke's Bay, with an interlude of three years in the 1980s in Aberystwyth, Wales at the Welsh Plant Breeding Station, which has just completed its 100th year of existence. 
I completed my PhD on nitrogen fixation in white clover under high soil nitrogen conditions, most relevant for today. John Hay, ex-director of Grasslands, was living in what was called New Zealand House due to the number of New Zealanders that had lived in this cottage on the Welsh plant breeding station. It was nearly considered a rite of passage for most grassland scientists to go through the Welsh plant breeding station in those days. And uh, over our period there, we, were, um, we had many visitors from New Zealand coming through. Following this, I moved to the heady heights of Wellington science policy, stake up a position at the newly formed Ministry of Research, Science and Technology, just at the start of the science reforms. Oops. I'll discuss this a little bit later, the, the, these reforms, but they are the most far reaching reforms that have, had occurred in the um, science system. Over the 10 years I was at Moore, some of the most far reaching uh, issues were considered, uh, including the formation of different organisations. I also spent one year on secondment at the State Services Commission, being a desk officer for the Department of Corrections totally different experience, I might add. In 2000, 2000, I returned to MAF, now called the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, in the Resource Policy Group, covering a wide range of environmental science topics, but particularly climate change, water, soils, nutrients, and cadmium in grasslands. In 2011, I then moved to the Science Policy Group in the now called Ministry for Primary Industries, where I am currently currently. My science successes. I've always felt that the objective of any scientist is to bring more knowledge and value to New Zealand and the world and outputs and outcomes then were expand, expended by the New Zealand taxpayer to keep them employed. This is my personal goal and indicator and when I look back was this achieved? Um, going through my some of the successes over my career, magnesium supplementation of dairy cows was some of the earliest work I did in collaboration with the late Peter Young from Ruakura. After four years of detailed field work, the stage was set for practical on-farm magnesium supplementation, supplementation pre and post calving that reduced hypermagnesemia cow deaths, but also increased annual milk production by 10 to 15% setting the stage for practices still widely used today. Recent estimates suggest that this practice alone has added billions of dollars to the dairy industry over the last 30 years. Looking at forage cultivar development and evaluation, I've been involved in a wide range of grassland species evaluations over my career. This has involved the evaluation of annuals and perennial grasses, legumes, herbs, shrubs and trees. I have um, been involved in the development of two plant variety rights for perennial ryegrasses and one for red clover, um, and have been involved in a wide range of different types of trials, including many farm system trials, looking at um, different cultivar species. I was involved with the late bull cane in the development of the more drought tolerant ecotype drought master, perennial ryegrass, widely used in the Hawke's Bay and later exported to Argentina. This was at the time where um, local ecotypes were of um, becoming of greater importance. For, for instance, Ellet ryegrass, um, which I understand Massey has just announced that the Ellet professor, professorship at Massey University for grasslands. This work was on the cusp of the discovery of endophytes, their important and their important role in uh, agriculture. Other species that I looked at would included Sala, sheep's burnet, tree lucerne, and, and research on lucerne as well. Moving on to soil and nutrient management, uh, this is a key part of some of the research that was done. Pastures are only as good as the soils and nutrients that are available to allow them to grow. Trials included nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, trace elements, and lime responses. In many cases, they were being done at the behest of the national series being run out of Ruakura by scientists such as Chris During, 
Doug Edmeads, Ants Roberts, Mike O'Connor and Bert Quinn. I suspect the results are still the foundation of the calibrations used in Overseer and uh, may now need to be timely uh, refreshed. At a minimum, farmers need to replace the nutrients taken off and animal products. At an optimum, they need to allow for all the other losses that occur. These simple principles seem to have been forgotten in some farming concepts today. The key success was the development of the fertiliser advice uh, work for the Taranaki farmers based on the research carried out in the region on its unique Elephantic soils. I've been pleased to support recent reviews of nutrients and soils research in New Zealand carried out by a wide range of scientists here today. Reviews looking back where, uh, on and where to know to go forward should be an important part of any scientist's career today. In terms of nitrogen fixation by white clover, this is still a major source of nitrogen inputs into New Zealand pastures, despite the nitrogen fertiliser inputs increasing from 60,000 tonnes in 1990 to 460,000 tonnes by 2018. The recent water policy legislation limiting nitrogen inputs to 190 kilograms per hectare per annum might impact this, but that's another story. The work that was done over several years showed that it was possible to breed white clover for a continued level of nitrogen fixation under high soil nitrogen conditions, where it produced by where it both nodulated and fixed nitrogen. This provides for the option of reducing nitrogen fertilizer as well. Other key conclusions were that for Taranaki soils, the indigenous rhizobium population was as effective at nodulation and nitrogen fixation as the standard commercial TA1 strain. Dosing legume seeds with rhizobium inoculum and sown into high fertility Taranaki soils did not affect seedling germination or growth. This possibility, this possibly holds uh, for most high fertility soils in New Zealand. New research seeking to overcome this is still very relevant. This work continues with two proposals supported as smart ideas in the latest MB endeavour round. Uh, my next area was looking at improved seedling germination in hill country. This has been an area that uh, I have always thought that sheep and beef farmers have sought to achieve so that they could take advantage of the improved species and cultivars that were being produced. The hypothesis was to reduce seedling competition and enhance seedling germination and growth to achieve this in the very thick swards of hill country pastures. For four years, a range of options were looked at and a range of grasses and legume species. The, the treatments included increasing average seed size, use of grass and legume herbicide coated seeds, assessing the, the impact of gibberellic acid hormones on, as a seed treatment, and even the low dose of uh, cobalt-60 gamma radiation treatment to enhance seedling vigour and establishment. Success was achieved by some of these treatments, but are never widely adopted in practice. A new revival is warranted um, with the promotion of the multi-species mixtures considered under region agriculture. Policy for science, um, we have two elements we look at, policy for science in terms of advising EMB in terms of how it runs the science system, but just as important is the science that we need to inform the policy that we do. Over my many years in Morse and Math, now MPI, have been a strong advocate for evidence-based policy decision-making. Uh, initially working with uh, Dr. Willie Smith, former head of geography at Auckland University, we did some groundbreaking research at Morse, such as seeing how many cabinet papers use science evidence. This was followed by work on science expert committees, uh, which have now become the norm in MPI, particularly in dealing with biosecurity threats, e.g. myrtle rust, cowrie dieback, mycoplasma bovis, each having science advisory committees. There, com there continues to be a clear need for strong scientific evidence into policy, as issues and policies become more complex. This has been strongly advocated in recent years by Professor Sir Peter Gluckman 
including during his time as the Prime Minister's um, Chief Science Advisor. I was, uh, I'll discuss some of this uh, a little bit later. Science and Demonstration Centre Development. I've had the privilege of being involved in with the establishing of a number of demonstration farms and working on research farms across the North Island. This has included Lyme trials at the Stratford Demonstration Farm, hypermagnesemia trials at Waimati West, the establishment of the Hawke's Bay Agricultural Research Centre at Bukawa, oversight of the Takapau Research Station in central Hawke's Bay, and finally providing um, MAPS input into the establishment of the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre. I consider that regional centres are the backbone of translating research results to practical options for farmer adoption. Their function nationally is important. We need more rather than less of these facilities. I just want to um, finish off here with some odds and ends and failures. Just as there, there are successes in science, there are failures. We will all remember that fertiliser trial where the farmer didn't tell you that he was going to have his aircraft fly over the next day and drop a load of superphosphate on it. I was involved in a project also looking at the feasibility of growing peanuts in Hawke's Bay. Yes, they grow and yield well, but they, there is a need for a whole capital intensive infrastructure to support an industry. But it's interesting to see now that they're doing this up in um, Northland and the first jar of New Zealand grown peanuts were sold the other day, I think on Trade Me. I was also involved in setting up grassland species trials in the Altiplano region in Chile to improve al alpaca nutrition at the stage where New Zealand was importing alpaca from this region. I remember hand cultivating plots at altitude with a splitting headache, only to find out that the hotel, um, that a hotel was built on the plots a year later. Such is science. My career has taken some strange, uh, been taken me to some strange places, like visiting Easter Island en route to Chile, and the Seychelles to represent New Zealand at an IPCC conference at which we were able to get New Zealand representation on the IPCC governing body. This is the only conference that I've been to where you actually had to turn up to the conference in a boat. I'd just like to move on now to some comments about the New Zealand science system as it was set up in 1989. This was where the major first shift in the New Zealand science system was set up, where there was a separation of policy from the funding and the doing of science. And there was also the establishment of new organisations to actually carry this out, MORST, FORST and the CRIs. What we had was a movement from marginal funding to full cost funding, making a large and making of a large proportion of the science contestable and we still have the Endeavour funds and Marsden funds today. It was the establishment of a national priority setting process, as well as the establishment of a science evaluation service. Uh, universities were also allowed into the contestable pools. Um, and finally, one of the elements was that the extension services were split from MAF and finally sold off. I'd like to talk about some of the elements around the science system that I have come to um, know and comment on over the years. Funding efficiency and contestable funding. It's interesting that the Endeavour Fund has about four to 500 bids per year. I've made inquiries by uh, with many parties that actually put in proposals and I've come to the conclusion that the cost of putting in a proposal ends up roughly around about 500,000 or half a million dollars per uh, major proposal and half of that for a smart idea. If we look at the total cost to the system of putting all those proposals in and the success rate of only 15% uh, of proposals, we come to the conclusion that the total lost funding of all those people that don't receive funding in the funding round is in the order of $100 million for a pot of money that 
provide $200 million of funding. You can all have your own um, conclusions as to the efficiency of such a contestable system. The other point that I've always found strange is the, the need for inflation adjustment, which I've never seen in the majority of proposals that I've seen. Science inflation, um, I've found out, is about twice that of normal CPI inflation. So that if we take a, a, a bid that lasts seven years, and we look at 5% um, inflation per year. At the end of that proposal, they are only 60% um, or 66% of the total value of the proposals that they put in at the start. There's never been a provision for uh, inflation adjustment in our uh, science system. Just moving on to some other areas where I, I would like to talk about some what I term science system myths. Value for money in research is the constant cry from many quarters. The latest NB statistics provide some interesting insights. Publications per New Zealand researcher per year are 0 0.7 versus OECD, the OECD average of 0 0.3. Equally, publications per million dollars spent from higher education and government research expenditures are five for the OECD versus 13 for New Zealand scientists, over twice as cost effective per million dollars spent. While well, these are only indirect key indicators of our research productivity, they provide in insights into system effectiveness. It's time to get off the cost efficiency bandwagon and ensure that the right science is being done and extended. Duplication of science is often raised as a concern by public and external non-science uh, non reviewers. A worrying concern is at the wastage of taxpayer funds and hard-earned money. A key element of biological research is that it is inherently variable and uncertain, subject to the vagaries of environment and genetics. To overcome this, genetic um, duplication of trials is necessary for good science and not a wasteful luxury as presented by some. Also, ver verification of science outputs can only occur if the experiment can be duplicated by another scientist, a key criterion of the scientific method. In grassland science, this holds true even more so, uh, so we can be confident of the advice being provided to farmers. Science collaboration is also a constant cry from many quarters. How bad are we and can we collaborate better? Still many of the basic questions about collaboration are not clear. Does collaboration provide better science more quickly? In 2018, MB performance statistics showed that the proportion of publications with international science co-authorship was 54% for New Zealand research papers and 29% for OECD papers. In the agricultural and uh, Biological Sciences, world average collaboration rates and publications were 61% for New Zealand versus 27% for the world. We are good collaborators um, now between scientists. Where, where collaboration might need to be enhanced is with our science users. Where do we go from here? International collaboration is imperative for us to create the value from the 99% of scientific discovery that's done outside New Zealand. And finally, science excellence is the driver of the current science system. This has driven the balance of projects and the likes of the Endeavour Fund into more basic and strategic science, I believe. And I, um, and I consider that this has moved away from applied problem issue driven science so urgently needed today. How, however, Excellence is in the eye of the beholder. We should never accept poor science, but equally excellent science in New Zealand should not be seen as just basic science. All science can be excellent, providing it meets the acceptable scientific standards and methodologies and statistics. An understanding of this should be taught to every graduate of science um, qualification and in funding programs. Moving on, agricultural science. How much should we? Uh, how much should agricultural science be funded in the country? The latest uh, research and development statistics in 2018 showed about 
$528 million of investment in ag science, the majority funded by the government. The current funding for science in New Zealand is 1.23% of GDP, one of the lowest developed country expenditures in the OECD, which has an average of 2.38%. The government in its recent strategy documents, um, the RS and I strategy in 2019, had sought to get all political parties to commit to a 2% um, of GDP research funding. While still less than the average of the OECD, it would allow substantial increases across all sectors, including grassland science. The greatest proportion for government science funding in agriculture comes from MB, approximately three quarters uh, of all government funding, with MPI being the second largest at roughly 100 million across all primary sectors. I encourage the Grasslands Association to strongly promote and advocate for a, an increase in research investment to 2% of GDP going forward. So if that's what we think we need for agricultural science in total, how much do we need for grassland science? Reading back to my days in Morse in the mid 1990s, when the investment in forage uh, research was identified, a figure of $23 million in 1992-3 was identified. CPI inflation adjusted to today would have it, um, we should have a minimum of 40 million. What is it now? I'm sorry, I can't actually tell you as these figures are hard to extract from the system at present. But what is enough for a sector that brings in 30 billion in export earnings per annum? Science into policy. I mentioned this um, earlier, more robust science into policy I think is essential. Never before has there been a need for robust science evidence to feed into the policy that's been formed. We need to make sure that the policies, legislation, regulations affecting our pastoral farmers are science informed and fit for purpose, e.g. water quality, quantity, climate change, biosecurity. What does robust science look like? There are many articles and papers out there, but some of the best I've come across include 20 tips for, for interpreting science claims. Um, this list will help non-scientists to interrogate science advisors and grasp the limitations of evidence. And I'll, I'll bring them up in a minute for you to look at. Another includes standards for evidence and policy and decision making, um, which was developed by a multi disciplinary team. I, I can give um, references to these um, papers later on. OK, if we look at the 20 tips for interpreting science, uh, this, level, this will hopefully help non-scientists and advisors um, and what they need to do to question scientists. I'm sure scientists have run across virtually every one of these cir circumstances um, in their science careers. Um, bias is rife, bigger than usual, bigger is usually better in sample size, correlations do not imply causation. This is a very good example here with the, the current um, suggestion about nitrate levels in water and colon cancer in the Canterbury area. Regression to the mean can mislead. Um, controls are important, getting randomization bias. Um, scientists are human. I think this is very correct. They make mistakes like everybody else. Um, significant is significant when we've got um, statistical significance. Effects of size matters. If you see large differences in results, these do matter and should be taken um, into account. Um, dependencies and change in risks. Um, data that can be dredged or cherry picked and extreme measurements uh, may lead the results. These are all things that anybody questioning and reviewing science, be they, be they farmers or peer reviewers, need to look at to get the best out of the results that they're looking at and providing it to policy. Secondly, I've presented this framework for standards in policy or, or farming. When I looked at this, framework here, I considered that any farmer, any scientist could use this when they evaluate a new technology or a new practice that they're actually putting in place. If you look at the one end, it goes from 
is this just a theory that's been proposed to, you know, in the middle consensus on the evidence, there is a consensus, they're using standardized approaches to look at it. And finally, uh, the impact has been validated. The application, the scaling, the evaluation is widely replica replicated across populations, different parts of New Zealand, settings with converging interpretations and outcomes, where you're getting the same results across a wide range of different circumstances. I think this presents an interesting framework that anybody can use to interpret their um, science, policy, and new systems of farming. Okay, so let's move on to what the future of science we need for grasslands might look like. Um, firstly, the biggest threat to grasslands, I do believe, is climate change. I wrote my first paper on climate change in agriculture from, from the Hawke's Bay in 1989. Dare I go back and uh, read what I said in light of one of the biggest droughts Hawke's Bay has ever had. I did and would have to rewrite that paper if it were today. Looking back, I've been involved in nearly every aspect of climate change in agriculture, from international negotiations to, to doing policy on the infamous fart tax, to being involved in setting up the National um, Greenhouse Gas Inventory um, and also some of the research funds that have been carried out in climate change over the years. I think what has happened with the implementation of the recent legislation, the Climate Change Zero Carbon Amendment Act um, and the, the um, establishment of the Climate Change Commission Hey, Waka Rekanoa, we have seen a significant progress in, the, in the, um, the whole area of climate change. There is a clear need to keep our um, eye on the ball and get practical consumer and regulatory acceptable mitigations. The need for more relevant New Zealand science and climate change is still required as we have only touched the surface to meet our New Zealand requirements. The other elements in looking at climate change is we need to look at the impacts of drought and persistence of our grazing um, species and the pests that are going to affect them and how this might change over time with our changes in biosecurity threats and needs. I'd also like to promote the need for another national grassland survey for New Zealand. There have been two grassland surveys of New Zealand, one in the 1930s, 40s, and the second in 87, 88. Uh, after over 30 years, it's time for the next one. Only by understanding uh, what we've got and how it has changed can we understand what we might need in the future. This data needs to be put into national grass species maps linked to all the other national uh, maps that we have, like the land cover database and other databases made available to one and all. We need to update our nitrogen and phosphate balances. And here I'm talking about the national balances. Uh, Roger Parfit did work in the, in the uh, mid to late 2000s, looking at both, both phosphate and nitrogen balances for the country. It's time when we update these balances, uh, which are vital for our um, country. This should also be done at the farm level as well, which probably can be done with some of the models we have got at present. We also need to um, advance climate change adaptation research. It's all very well to look at the impacts of climate change, which have been fully recognised and with significant air, um, input into mitigation research. But we do know that the bow wave of climate change that is going to happen in the future means that we're going to need to adapt. And so we need the research to understand what the adaptation approaches we need to take are. Long-term trials, I'm an advocate of long-term trials. We need to preserve our current uh, and extend the number of long-term trials in New Zealand. We're slowly seeing their, their demise with only winch more secured under long-term arrangements. Um, Ballantrae's future is uncertain with the new highway passing through some of it, and water water has been passed into new ownership. But it is interesting, I read a paper yesterday of some recent research that uh, looking at cadmium 
in phosphate application on those three sites um, and, and the data had been used that was the most up-to-date data that's still being used to produce papers from those three sites. It's interesting to see that um, experiments like the free air carbon dioxide enrichment experiment at Bulls, um, what the impacts are of elevated CO2 and how they have changed the environment over time. This shows the value of long-term data um, and that we need a new funding model to actually allow this to happen. We need to enhance our knowledge and uh, transfer extension efforts. This is the currently the weak link in our whole science system. More science doesn't get, um, most science doesn't get past the publishing or peer reviewed paper stage. Um, during the early reforms of the science system, there was discussion about allowing for extension and adoption objectives in proposals and bids where funding was provided. There is little point in, in spending uh, in the order of one and a half billion dollars in more research if this doesn't get out there and be used by parties that can create value from it. This is the only way we're going to get from moving from what's termed outcomes to out from outputs to outcomes. And once again, needs to be brought fully more and more closely linked to the science system. The, the grasslands role in biodiversity conservation um, at the landscape level needs to also be considered. With the passing of the New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy, which only relates to Indigenous biodiversity, uh, there is still, however, a need to consider and maintain our introduced biodiversity. With nearly all of New Zealand's primary sectors reliant on introduced germplasm, both plant and animal, and with changing farming systems and climate, there is a risk of losing genetic diversity, which will be essential going forward. We should be thinking now about what we might require in the future. Uh, what species should we be looking at? What genes should we preserve? I'd also like to raise the issue of thinking more laterally about the use of grasslands and at present one of those areas might be in energy production. So in terms of bioenergy, we could look at its role in bioenergy crops such as muscansis. I can get the, the, that out easily. Um, and also its use for um, across the board in terms of um, energy and linking into the broader energy considerations um, that might be considered in our national network. I'd also like to see the greater use of genetics. New Zealand has had a prou proud heritage of using genetics to get um, desirable characteristics for agriculture. We need to re-engage the public in the greater use of modern genetic te techniques. Genetic technology has powered the development of COVID vaccine, being injected into the arms of all the human population. Surely genetic technologies um, need to be used to address other global emergencies like climate change. And finally, I'd like to say we need to sell the New Zealand story about our grasslands. Outdoor, non-housed, pasture-based farming. One of the most powerful arguments for New Zealand grassland agriculture in the in a time of need of, for food security is that New Zealand ruminants by and large don't consume food that could be used directly by, for human consumption. Beef and lamb have been ta have taken to social media to present their story. Equally many, many hill country practices which uh, we see are regenerative, le regenerative, leading to suggested improvements in soil carbon. Finally, I'd like to finish up by providing my advice in terms of a career in science. All of you will either have children or might be some of you might be starting off your careers this is my list of advice um, for a, a career in science. Firstly, you need to have intense curiosity and a questioning mind. Secondly, supportive mentors, coaches and or managers. And I can remember some of my um, managers in the past like Bill Kane, who allowed me to make mistakes, 
but also supported me in providing facilities and resources to take ideas forward. You need patience and persistence for all the tedious work done. Just remember that science is 95% perspiration, 5% inspiration. Reliance uh, for all those ideas that don't get funded, you need resilience. And um, for those that are actually just put their, just finished the last endeavor round, which had a success rate of 12.5%, this will be most important. You need bloody mindedness to stand behind the results produced. If you believe in your work and your methodology and your results, you need to promote them as strongly as possible. You need a sense of humour to get through all of those days when you question why you are here. And the this is probably a, a situation that most of us are in now with COVID and being locked down in different circumstances. You need the ability to present your work and make it interesting. And finally, um, it's important that you address real world problems that make uh, the world better for all. So I could go on, but it's time to come to a close. I thank you for allowing me the privilege of this random walk through grassland science and the science system. It's but a cursory look, but I hope it challenges all of you to think about the future gra of grasslands and the science system needed to support it. As you might be aware that um, the future pathways exercise that MB is currently redoing will mean that there will be a discussion document about the science system coming out in the next month or so. I advise the society and its members to actually contribute to that. Thank you, um, this presentation. I, I have to put a disclaimer at the end. This presentation gives my views and not necessarily those of my employer. Kamua, Kamuri. Look back in order to move forward. Thanks, John. Thanks, Gerald. That was excellent. So for those of you uh, wanting to ask a question, you can do that in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, um, just a couple of questions for you, Gerald, that you might wish to answer or you may not wish to. But you mentioned the current challenge from plant-based protein over animal protein production. And this could be seen as a potential threat to the future of New Zealand pastoral agriculture. How do you believe New Zealand can manage this challenge and maintain itself as a premier producer of animal protein? Uh, it's probably the only point that I didn't cover, John. I'm glad you noticed that in there because it's probably too hard to cover. But look, I'm a firm believer that I think that um, animal protein, if you look at the um, statistics and the requirement for animal protein going forward, there is an increase in animal protein demand globally. I didn't actually put that um, particular slide up. So despite what people are saying about pushing for plant protein, uh, animal protein demand is growing just at the same rate, if not greater than plant protein. So there'll be a demand for um, animal protein, which New Zealand can provide um, using its image, its clean green um, outdoor story, basically that it's got. And I believe that we have great prospects going forward for the animal sector. Uh, the other element is, is I don't believe that I have seen a very comprehensive life cycle analysis for the plant sector. What I don't see is what is the impact of continuous cultivation of land for crop based systems, the loss of soil carbon, the loss of soil structure, what that's going to do to that system in the long term. Yep. No, thanks for that. You also mentioned um, that in the past there'd been a, a fairly hardwired connection from research and development to the farming community through advisors. That link weakened about 30 years ago. Um, do you see this as an issue? And if so, how can it be remedied now? Mm -hmm. Is it past remedying? So, um, yes, uh, it is an issue, and I highlighted that going through. I, I do believe um, that this is um, where we can make some of the biggest progress in, in grasslands farming and getting our science out there. Um, MPI is basically looking at um, enhancing the whole extension system 
by looking for advisors in different areas. And that is um, a major focus on a lot of the work that's going forward at present. So, you know, watch the space. We're going to need a lot of people uh, and more advisors going forward, particularly with farmer plans. And we're going to need those people and, and MPIs working on that at present for a whole range of different programs. Right, that, that's encouraging, Gerald. Um, so you mentioned about um, the poor efficiency in our funding system with regard to 12, was it 12 and a half percent of the current applications were funded. Um, how how do you believe we can change this so that our R and D efficiency improves um, through better funding mechanisms? I mean, it's a bit of a loaded question in a way, but we we're stuck in a contestable system, which really, in my view, isn't serving as well. How how can we change that? Um, you can tell the government how you want to change it in about a month's time when MB puts out its discussion document, basically, which will ask you all of those questions. Basically, how should the, the system be set up around funding and priorities and, and, and what should the system look like going forward? How can we make this system more efficient? Um, I, have, I haven't got the right idea. It might be that we have a higher proportion of more stable funding. And I think that that's where the system has been moving slowly with a lot more of the money going into the, um, what do they call it, the SIF area of yeah. funding. Yeah. Um, so I suspect that that's where that might be part of the solution, but I think there will always be a need for a contestable area to get, allow that opportunity for ideas. But then again, if you get, persuade the government to move to 2% of GDP, you might have enough money to fund those extra 50%. Um, Yes, I think I've heard that we need to get close to 2% of GDP for probably the last 30, 35 years, but let's not go there. There's a <laughs> question here uh, about your comment regarding white clover cultivars that continue to fix nitrogen. Yeah. I think that was regard to when nitrogen is applied. Um, what happened to this concept? Would this be a risk of increasing nitrogen loss? I think that could be the case and what you would have to do in parallel is the issue of reducing nitrogen fertilizer that's going on at the same time. So if you have a system where you would allow the nitrogen, the, the legumes to fix nitrogen at, at the same time you were, you were reduced your nitrogen inputs through fertilizer, I think you could accommodate that uh, loss. But this is why I, was, I think it's important that farmers understand their nitrogen balances on their farm and what it looks like. Um, and that this, you know, we've got a regulated amount of 190 kilograms at present. Who knows what it might need to go to in the future? Yes, I suspect it will only go down, Gerald. Yep. So you talked about long term trials and the fact I think there's one left now and that's hanging by, well, not quite hanging by a thread, but it certainly um, is under a particular agreement. Um, how in the future would we fund these long term trials? I mean, these trials that run for 20 or 30 years in the current funding environment, when we've got a start stop funding contract system that just doesn't allow for that. Yeah, I, and that's why I think my comment was that we, we do need a new funding model for, for long term trials um, and commitments to it. I know even the face experiment, you know, we've, we've put money in over the years, dribs and drabs, just to keep the trial going. It does require a new funding model, and that could be part of the reform process that uh, might be needed going forward. Because that, we have a lot of other areas that are in the similar circumstances. There are things like collections and databases. Sure. These are sort of underpinning things that have slowly um, decreased in the, the proportion of um, funding that they've um, received. So there needs to be a broader funding consideration of all of those large infrastructure, long-term assets that um, we need for science. Yeah, well, the Margot Ford June Pleasant Centre would be a classic case there, which I don't think seen much of an increase in funding in the last 20 years, yeah. uh, just as an example. Just last question. Um, are you optimistic that um, New Zealand grassland production systems can manage the demands imposed by climate change demands and requirements? Uh, 
Thanks, John. That's the thousand dollar, million dollar question. The issue is we've seen droughts beyond our living memories, basically, and we need to start thinking now about what we need to do to cope with that um, going forward. And I think that's probably the biggest issue that needs to happen. We know that there's this bow wave of what's going to happen with climate change and that things are going to get progressively um, worse. Um, and so we need to be thinking now about what we need to be breeding for to actually cope with the uh, demands of the climates that we're going to see in the end. In the end, farming is about farming the climate, basically, and that's what farmers do. Sure. And so we need to be producing the, um, the, the, the cultivars, the species, and that, that actually is going to cope with what we project is going to be the climates of the future. Yes, and that may require different species, new management systems, yes. Yes. Maybe even genetic engineering, do we say it? I, I said that was the last question. I was wrong. There is one more. Uh, to what extent is the pastoral landscape management the responsibility of the farming community or is it the public good? It's a good question because when you think about it, when tourists come to New Zealand, what do they predominantly see? Grassland. Mm -hmm. So is it actually a public good or is it really the responsibility of the farming community to... Uh, manage our pastoral landscape? I think it should be, uh, it, it, it's, there is a requirement for both parties to consider what needs to be done. I think farmers need to have a strong stewardship um, role in managing grasslands in terms of what they do and how they, how they do it, taking it for the long, long haul. If we look at, um, say, Maori and corporations and their view about the land and how it should be managed going forward, I think there should be the, a strong stewardship ethic. But there is also elements of, of public good where some of those bits and pieces um, do have a um, requirement for the government and the public to consider supporting them as well. My, my feeling around some of the issues around even with food and climate change, how much is the responsibility of the farmer to, to pay for the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions versus the consumer that actually receives the product at the end of the day um, in terms of paying for some of those emissions. We don't seem to see that, that gap closing up yep. as much as we could. Great. Well, look, Gerald, thank you very much for giving us your thoughts today. Um, and <clears throat> If in fact uh, your employer does take some adverse dislike to what you've said, um, just say that I put you up to it. Um, <laughs> but we do appreciate the frankness with which you have uh, given us an overview of the policy funding system uh, and science structure uh, that we have uh, in New Zealand today. And we thank you for the part that you've paid, played in it in terms of maintaining common sense and uh, keeping uh, a lot of the bureaucrats in New Zealand with their feet on the ground. So we do appreciate that. And uh, again, congratulations for uh, winning the uh, Ray Brown Trophy. So that's it, everybody. So uh, thanks thank very, very much, much, John. I appreciate that. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye all.